All right, so in these two last lectures, I would like to talk a little bit more about the, let's say, environment in which we do uh, all of the computations and all the technical details that I've talked about in the last, what, 41 lectures now. So I've talked very about many technical aspects, very, let's say, uh, practical parts, but, but looking at very small pieces of it. And what I would like to do in the last two lectures is a little bit looking at the broader picture, at the, um, let's say, what is beyond the actual scientific computing. So in this lecture, I would like to talk about workflows in scientific computing. Um, this is the, the first part of um, something that I call beyond computational methods. And what I would like to talk about is, let's say, where does scientific computing or where do the things that we've talked about fit into the broader picture? The bigger picture is essentially this, um, that all of the numerical analysis and finite element methods and solvers and preconditioners and parallelization and scientific computing, that is really only one small piece of the whole picture. Because you need to remember that the reason why we do this is that because we want to simulate real processes in the real world, that we want to predict, for example, or we want to optimize. I think in mathematics we oftentimes forget this. We think that the goal is to solve the Laplace equation. But the goal is not to solve the Laplace equation. The goal is actually to solve the Laplace equation because it's a good model for something. So let's say if you think about um, the Laplace equation as the pressure in a porous medium, for example, then uh, we want to solve the Laplace equation because we want to, flow, to simulate the flow of fluids in a porous medium, for example. So our goal is really to predict the, the long-term goal, the, the overarching goal that motivates numerical analysis and the development of these mathematical methods is to predict and to optimize. Um, what this requires is um, a whole set of, um, let's say, um, skills that go far beyond just what we've talked about in the last few, um, well, many hours now. Namely, you need to understand the application. So let's say if you want to solve porous media flow, you need to understand what that application means. What, what is the pressure? What is the fluid velocities? What are the porosities, the permeabilities of a medium, for example? You certainly need to understand the numerical methods that you need to simulate this. You have to have an understanding of the complexity of algorithms. Complexity means how fast does it run? If I make the problem twice as large, does it run four times as slow? Does it run eight times as slow? these sort of things, because it, that, that affects how big a problem you can solve. You have to have at least a basic understanding, I think, of the hardware characteristics um, in order to, uh, let's say, find algorithms that can run efficiently on, on your machine. And then, of course, you need to have an understanding of um, the pre and post process pre- and post-processing tools that, that you have. So for example, in reality, you create meshes with a mesh generator, and you visualize with a visualization program. And so you, you need to know how to work with these. All of this together is called high-performance computing. So high-performance computing is, um, is not just the design of individual algorithms, but it is, let's say, the whole uh, looking at an application, solving it front to back. So to give you um, a few examples of this, um, I've taken a few pictures that we've created with DL2, um, and I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of the sort of things that people want to do with numerical simulation. So for example, at the top left here is, a, uh, is uh, from a group in Germany uh, that wants to simulate how crystals grow. This is something that is very important if, for example, you want to manufacture semiconductors like, um, like um, silicon that you need to know that you get a, um, um, a single crystal of a fairly large size because that's what determines the electric properties of, um, of semiconductors. It needs to be without defects. So you want to simulate this. And of course, if you want to do this, the process is three-dimensional. You also have to know a lot about the properties of the, of the, um, of the molten um, metal that you're going to um, crystallize here. So there's a lot of practical knowledge of the actual material. Here's a problem uh, from biomedical imaging that I've done with my um, colleague and friend Amit Joshi uh, a couple of years ago, where we simulate how light um, propagates in tissue because we want to um, do, let's say, three-dimensional imaging of tumors. 
And so, again, you need to understand how does light propagate in tissue. And in this case, uh, you need to understand, let's say, um, where the geometry comes from. Uh, you need to understand what the material parameters are. Let's say, how, how much diffusion do you have in tissue of light? Um, how much absorption do you have? What is it that the camera can see when you, uh, when you capture the light that comes out again? What does it actually mean? What, you, what the camera measures, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot more than just being able to solve a partial differential equation. You actually have to understand the, the, the model, the problem that's behind this. And at the bottom right here, for example, um, is an example where um, I simulate uh, the uh, flow in the Earth mantle. So this is the Earth core in the middle. We're sitting somewhere up here on the Earth's crust, and in between you've got an, a region that is called the Earth mantle, where you have hot material that rises up and cold material that, that falls down. And so we would like to simulate how this sort of um, how these transport processes work. Because we want to understand, let's say, the, the history of the Earth, how much mixing there is. What is it that drives, for example, the motion of, um, of the plates that make up the Earth's surface, and so on and so forth. So again, it is important to, um, if you want to do this realistic, it is important to understand the, the properties of the fluid. It is important to understand what typical temperatures are, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of subject knowledge that goes into these bigger picture computations. It is not just a Stokes equation that you have to solve, but you actually have to understand what the Stokes equation represents and where these parameters come from, and what they mean, and what the output means. And if you can somehow correlate what you get from your simulation to what you see in the real world. So the bigger picture is much broader than just solving the PDE. So there is a certain process that, that uh, we typically follow. And I'm going to give you um, just a brief overview, and then I'm going to run you through an actual complete pro complete example. So th the typical process if you have, let's say, a real industrial size or scientific engineering kind of problem is that the first thing is you need to identify the geometry and the details of the model like parameters and material properties. When you create a geometry um, then um, or a mesh, then um, Let's start with the geometry. Oftentimes, geometries are very difficult. Um, so here's a, um, um, a fighter plane, for example. This sort of thing can consist of tens of thousands of pieces. And just to identify the geometry, let's say with a, with a CAD program, a computer-aided design program, um, is enormously labor intensive. Um, you need to interface with the designers of this object. You need to interface with the people who manufacture it to understand the, 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 the sizes of these, of these objects. Um, so just to find out what the object looks like can be very difficult. Um, the same thing happened in, um, in this example where I talked about the uh, biomedical imaging. In that case, we had stereo cameras to determine the surface of, um, of, the, uh, of the, the, the piece of the body that we wanted to image. So it was rather difficult just to get the geometry into our program. The next step is when you have the geometry, you need to generate a mesh um, and maybe partition it so that you can uh, run things in parallel. This is still part of pre-processing. Generating a mesh uh, can be very, very um, um, expensive computationally as well. It might involve tens of millions of cells. Um, so here's a 2D example. Here's a 3D example. And you already see that because you have to resolve all of these little details, the number of cells might be enormously large. It turns out that mesh generation is something that is incredibly difficult to parallelize. And so um, it's often done on a single machine with a lot of memory that can hold the entire mesh. When you have the mesh, then you need to solve your um, differential equations on this. And this is something that you can do with, say, with finite elements or finite volumes, finite differences. I've shown you in the last few lectures how to parallelize things. So for some of these computations, um, that have been done on realistic geometries. These are among the biggest computations that, ever, that have ever been done on tens of thousands of processors today, on hundreds of thousands of processors, um, millions of CPU hours, um, using any number of, of algorithms, finite differences, finite volumes, and so on and so forth. Um, oftentimes, highly parallel, 
Um, so th that is an example of where uh, you really need to know something about the algorithms. When you have the solution, uh, you typically want to visualize it. And um, we do this because, of course, we want to learn from the numerical results, right? I mean, um, the person who visualized this here, for example, um, wanted to visualize one particular thing, namely um, do vortices form or eddies. Um, here, this is an example from convection in the Earth's interior. We wanted to know, are there plumes that rise up here, for example, and what are the structures on the Earth's core? Um, so. Without visualization, you cannot learn of, of data. Visualization is an important part to understand what you have just solved. You can do visualization in parallel. Both visit and peer review can run in parallel. The problem that you typically face is just the enormous amount of data. So a typical computation from these Earth um, mantle simulations here we oftentimes have hundreds of gigabytes of data that need to be visualized. And that's just a, a logistical challenge to deal with this much data. Here's another um, example um, that is not just a plot, but it is, I mean, it is, um, it is a picture that shows something. It is a, um, I found this on the internet somewhere. It is an example of a, um, uh, of a thundercloud. And um, what it does is, it, so it shows you this, the surface of the cloud, but it also shows you these particles here that are starting close to the surface, and it shows you how they're transported into um, into the high atmosphere. So what you see from this, uh, from this example is that visualization oftentimes is not just to plot data, but actually you plot it in a way that it provides insight. And I think I've made this point before, and I think it was in lecture 11 when I talked about how to visualize things in visit, that the goal is not to just you know, dump a whole a bunch of data onto the screen but that you want to think about what is it that, uh, that you actually want to show? What is it that you want to demonstrate with the data? And I think this is a particularly good example where somebody had thought very hard about what is it that they want to learn, namely how particles are transported up into the high atmosphere. So there's a lot of art, there's a lot of, um, um, a lot of work that goes into um, visualizing data. And then, of course, the fifth step would be to um, just repeat this whole thing, because um, typically we don't do computations just because we want to do one computation, but we want to improve the design. We want to change the shape of the, of the wing. We want to um, explore different material parameters and so on and so forth. So we want to, um, to uh, let's say, optimize. That would be improve a design. We want to investigate different conditions for the fighter plane, different speeds, altitudes, angles of attack. We might not know certain parameters, um, so we might not, let's say, uh, know the exact, um, I don't know, thrust of the, um, of the plane. So we might want to play with this and see how it behaves with different amounts of thrust. Um, we might not know certain material properties either, and then we want to make it robust. Um, then we might want to play with things like the mesh size, for example, to make sure that the answer that we get really is realistic. And finally, um, when you do a computation, well, what tells you whether the computation is actually a good match for reality, right? So oftentimes what you need to do is you need to run computations for different, let's say, with different methods or different sets of parameters in order to identify which of these actually matches reality best. And so, um, for example, today, when you design an airplane, we do a lot of computations today for airplanes, um, but we still run a few scale models in a wind tunnel because we want to match the computation with the actual experiment. Um, so we, we want to, let's say, gauge the accuracy of our computations. So I would like to uh, show you these steps um, with a concrete example. Um, this is from a course that Patrick uh, Butcher has taken from me last year in, uh, in Heidelberg. Um, Patrick was an undergraduate student. Um, it was a, um, a two-week intensive course on DL2. And um, he asked me what kind of project he uh, should do. And I uh, said, well, I have just, given, ha have just been given a uh, geometry for a drill, uh, let's say a power drill, for example, by uh, a colleague of mine, Jörg Fohne. And I was interested in, let's say, this, this whole process of how you um, start from the first uh, 
let's say, description of the problem all the way through um, this whole thing. And Patrick, um, I, I think, gave a great example of, of how this works. It took him approximately 50 hours um, in these two weeks to, from starting to learn DL2 all the way to visualizi visualizing the results. And so I would like to talk you through, let's say, the different steps that he had to go through. So as I say, the goal is to simulate a, um, how a power drill deforms as we, um, uh, let's say, put it against an object and spin it. So the steps that we have to go through is uh, create or obtain a coarse mesh, um, then identify the model, in this case this is linear elasticity, um, implement it in a solver, and we needed to obtain material parameters that are realistic for steel. Um, we needed to mark up the geometry in order to um, describe where which kind of forces act on this geometry. We needed to identify the magnitude of the forces that act, um, mark up the geometry, that means to de in this case to describe the boundary approximation. The, the coarse mesh did not include uh, information about, let's say, the curvature of the object. Then we needed to post-process the results, uh, we needed to visualize it, um, and then um, if this was a realistic industrial example, we would want to optimize the drill and validate it with real-world data, so we would have to repeat this whole process multiple times. So let's, let's go through these steps. So this, the first step was to create or obtain a coarse mesh. In this case, um, the coarse mesh was available um, by Jörg Fohne from the University of Siegen, who had given me this mesh that you can see here. Um, so it, it shows the, uh, the twist in the drill. Um, and then let's see what we needed to do with this. Um, so the first step then was, what is the physical model? Um, in this case, the physical model is um, what we call linear small deformation elasticity in 3D, of course, where we have a, um, a differential equation here um, that contains the um, compression and the shear modulus. U is a vector valued quantity that at every point in our domain describes the um, displacement, the, the, let's say the, the, the three-dimensional deflection of my object. Um, F would be a body force, which is going to be zero in our case. Um, then I have a certain uh, part of the boundary that is fixed, where I fix the displacement, and a certain other part of the boundary where I impose a certain traction. And these should probably not be the same variables here. Um, so let's say this is GD for Dirichlet boundary condition, GN for Neumann boundary condition. We need to think about whether this is the appropriate model um, it turns out that in this case it is the appropriate model uh, because the displacements will in fact be very small. So the displacements that we found at the end of this process are going to be 0.3 millimeters and I think that is a realistic number. If uh, you relate the um, 0.3 millimeters with an overall size of this object of let's say 20 millimeters for example, then um, yes that is, a, um, that is a small displacement and the small displacement elasticity is certainly an appropriate model. But we have to think about these sort of issues. OK, so when you have the model, you need to implement it. Um, that was easy enough in this case, because step eight already solves the elasticity problem. So we just needed to change the right-hand side and the geometry. Mm -hmm. Then we needed to find out what, actually, uh, I should say this. When I say we, actually, the person who found out all of this, of course, is Patrick himself. I, I, very, I, I did very little about this. Um, the, this, this project. So he needed to go and find um, what the material properties are. Um, and so for that, he looked up um, what is the kind of steel that is being used in a drill. It turns out it is high-speed steel HS30. And you can go on the internet and find that it has a, um, a compression modulus of 207,000 newton per square millimeters and a shear modulus of 82,800. So these are the two coefficients that go into the equation here. So lambda and mu here. When you have this, um, then um, you need to start thinking about, let's say, where do which forces act? Um, so we, we decided, he decided, that um, the geometry should be clamped down here. So this is the part that is um, the part of the drill that is inside the power drill, uh, where we say that the um, deflection would be zero, for example. Um, and then 
there is of course a certain part of the cutting edge here um, that wraps around this, this edge. You see it here in, in higher resolution. Um, this is where it's going to shear off material from uh, the object that we try to drill through. And so there's going to be a force that acts normal to the surface in this direction, for example. When you have this, um, then you need to decide, well, okay, now I know where the forces act. Um, now, what is the force? What's the magnitude of the force? And it turns out that um, power tools, or power drills, do not actually um, say how much force they uh, produce, but they say how much torque they produce. And in Patrick's case, he looked it up, he went home, he came back the next morning and had looked it up, and it turns out that his power drill is rated up to 25 Newton meters. So you can convert, of course, the torque into, uh, into a force. Um, so you, you play with the forces until you find that the torque is equal to 25 Newton meters. Um, and then what you get is a deflection. So um, as you can see in this picture here, um, the deflection shows um, where something, actually this, this is not the deflection, this is still the, the forces. Um, so um, when you have the, uh, the forces, um, the next step in this case was that we needed to, uh, we realized that the uh, geometry that we had gotten from Jörg, the uh, was just a coarse mesh. And if you look at, if you refine the coarse mesh a number of times, what you will find is that there are all of these um, well, rectangles here, or quadrilaterals, that um, of course, if you don't say anything at all, will just, even under mesh refinement, remain flat quadrilaterals. So we needed to describe that the outer surface of this, um, of this drill, this whole surface here, was actually a, um, uh, let's say, a cylinder surface. And when you attach a cylinder object, you can go to step 49, for example, to see how we do these sort of things. If you do this, then um, take a look at how the geometry changes here. So it becomes nice and smooth. Um, so after a number of refinements, you get a nice and smooth surface. Um, for um, these inner walls here, for this part, we did not have any adequate description of the boundary, and so we didn't do anything. Um, that might be an inadequacy of our model. Um, I think we, um, let's say, if you really wanted to compare this with, um, with realistic um, actual experiments, maybe we would need to attack this problem too. I don't know, but it's, it's certainly something that is worthwhile being aware of. So, we have the geometry, we have the forces, we have the equation. Uh, you let it run. Um, and then um, what you get is a simulation where you could show for every point um, of this domain the actual displacement vector. So here um, you see um, these little vectors here. Um, so in this case, the displacement goes in this direction because the, uh, the drill was fixed and there was a force that pointed in this direction here. So. Um, a different way of visualizing this, of course, is um, you could show the mesh, for example. So uh, you see that, for example, it is nicely refined here at the interface where it's clamped. It's also refined where all the forces act and where the torsion is. It's not refined up here because there's no forces that act on that. The, we said that the cutting forces only start here. A different way of visualizing this is to show the displacement. Um, I don't know if you can see this. This is between 0 and 0 0.3 millimeters. Um, so the, the largest displacement is here where the, the forces act. Um, you can also plot, you can convert the displacement to torsion angle. Um, so the torsion angle is between 0 and 0 0.3. I think this is in degrees. Yes, in degrees. Um, so this is sort of um, a tool to gauge whether the, the drill will break or not, for example. So, and you can plot again the, um, the displacement vectors um, in millimeters if you want to. The last step, of course, would be that you just repeat this. Um, let's say if you were working for a power drill company, then um, the goal is not just to simulate something. I mean, yes, maybe we learned something. Maybe we learned that the displacement is 0 0.3 millimeters. But probably what you want to do is you want to find out, for example, if different steels would produce a different displacement. Or maybe you realize that 0 0.3 millimeters is too much. Um, 
how do you change this? Well, maybe we need to enlarge the, the diameter of the drone. Or maybe we need to modify the cutting surface, and so on and so forth. So typically, these um, eight or nine steps that I showed you, you will go through them in loops. You will uh, improve on your design. You will um, run your simulation again, and so on and so forth. So this, this is part of a bigger process. The actual computation and, let's say, writing the solver is really only a fairly small part of the actual workflow that you have to go through. So to sum this up, um, each one of these steps in uh, high-performance computing um, that use uh, partial differential equations would be, well, um, identify geometries, details of the model, pre-process, solve the problem, post-process, and repeat. Each one of these steps is going to require that you have um, certain skill sets, namely that you need to have domain knowledge. You need to understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve, not just what the PDE is, but let's say where it comes from, what it means. You need to certainly know something about the mathematical description of the problem. Um, so it would certainly help if you know that the elasticity equation is a, a positive definite operator, for example. You need to know something about algorithm design. You certainly need to know something about the design of software and the management of software, because typically you deal with very large problems. And so you see that, that the, um, in the real world, if you really want to solve um, partial differential equations in, let's say, for applications, that it's much more than just the things that we have talked about in this class so far. It's not just finite elements. It's much more. And um, so with this, um, I, I, I will uh, finish this lecture. I hope I have given you a little bit of an idea of that um, solving problems like these is, is a much bigger problem. Um, in many cases, much beyond my own uh, knowledge as well. You will have to work with people who have domain knowledge. You will have to work with people who, let's say, are the designers of the objects that you simulate, and so on and so forth. So you might work with people from geophysics, from aerospace. They will give you the insights and, and the knowledge to simulate the sort of thing that they are interested in. Let's say, if you're the person who knows about solving PDEs, then you will have to work with people from other fields who help you with this, this bigger picture. The next lecture, um, the last lecture in the sequence that I would like to, um, to give to you, uh, will deal with just one piece of, um, of, this, um, of this thing. Because let's say if we do the uh, PDE solution using finite elements, typically you will be the person who deals with the software. And so I would like to talk a little bit about um, problems with software management uh, and so on and so forth. But with this, I think I'll, um, I'll leave you. I hope you understand the bigger picture better now. And um, I'll talk about software in the next lecture. Thank you.